My name is Drew Burdett, and I'm your RUF pastor here at Boise State. Uh, it's good to serve on your behalf. The Lord's been at work. We had a phenomenal, um, my first year, and RUF's uh, 12th year on campus here at Boise State. So thank you so much for your prayers and your support. If you would like to know how you can pray for us, if you would like to receive our newsletters, or even maybe even support the work that we're doing, I put a, a newsletter sign-up sheet out on the table. Uh, I'd love it's super quick. Your name, your number, uh, and your email. My information is also out there. So if you'd like to get into contact with me, it's a great way to do it. Um, please do that before you head out. So uh, back in 2020, uh, I don't know if you remember what you were doing in 2020. I think most of us probably remember most of that year. Uh, my family and I, we moved from Seattle to Seattle, Washington, to Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, I spent a lot of time during the second half of that year traveling between Corvallis and Portland and then back again all in one trip. And so it's an hour and a half up from uh, Corvallis to Portland, an hour and a half back, which is exactly the amount of time that you need to listen to the Hamilton musical soundtrack <laughs> completely from beginning to end, which I did a lot. I don't know if you're Hamilton fans, if you've seen it either on Broadway or have watched the Disney Plus or listened to it, but early in the musical, there's this scene where the main, you know, the main protagonist, uh, Alexander Hamilton, he meets some of the most important characters in the movie, or sorry, in the movie, the play, um, in the musical. And uh, the scene is this, Alexander Hamilton, he goes out for a drink with Aaron Burr, and they run into the boys, right, John Lawrence, Hercules Mulligan, and Lafayette. And here's the scene, and if you haven't seen the musical or, or listened to it, just so you know, it's hip-hop and uh, as a genre, and I am not going to rap this for you, because if I did, my anxiety, I probably have a panic attack right here on the stage, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, you're going to have to uh, imagine what this might sound like. But Lauren says when they walk in, well, if it ain't the prodigy of Princeton College, Aaron Burr, give us a verse, drop some knowledge. And Burr responds, good luck with that. You're taking a stand. You spit, I'm a sit. We'll see where we land. And the boys boo, and then they respond to him. They say, Burr, the revolution's imminent. What do you stall for? And then there's a little bit of a silence, and Hamilton speaks. He pipes in for the first time, and he says, if you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? And then all eyes are on him. And the other boys, they say, oh, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who is this kid? What's he going to do? And then and the, and the anticipation builds and we hear Hamilton's declaration that the rest of the musical kind of unpacks. He says, I am not throwing away my shot, right? When Hamilton shows up in, in, uh, in the scene, there's this buzz around him. Who is he? Who is this kid? What's he going to do? And this morning, we're going to read the very first, uh, first half of the chapter of Mark, and when, when Jesus shows up in the Gospel of Mark in the first century, there is a similar buzz about him. Who is this kid? What's he going to do? Now, it doesn't sound like that because Mark wasn't written uh, as hip-hop. It sounds more like, who is he to forgive sins? Or, who is this man who even the wind and the waves obey him? Or as they heard his teaching, who is this we have never heard anything like this at all. See, Jesus does not fit any normal category. He's different. Like, it's clear that he's religious, and yet he's not one of the normal religious leaders. He's not a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Uh, he's not a rabbi in any traditional sense or a scribe. We'll learn that he's royal, but at the same time, he is not from the, uh, the line of, of Herod, who is currently in power. Speaking of power, we'll read, as we read through it, we'll see he is incredibly powerful, and yet he is not a Roman official who had power of the day. He's from Nazareth, of all places. And when he shows up, though, he draws a crowd. Everyone wanted to come and see Jesus. Who is this guy, and what is he going to do? In Mark 1, uh, we get our first glimpse of Jesus. I'm going to read this for us. It's in your order of worship. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. And what I'd invite you to do this morning, as we read these verses, even if you've read them a hundred times, a million times, I don't care, read them as if it was the first time, as we were being introduced to Jesus. Let's read this now. The beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
And as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news, the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Mark uh, and the ways that he studied and... Uh, and uh, met with people, interviewed people, studied the things that you did and the things that you said and put it down for us to know. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that as we read this passage that is probably pretty familiar to a lot of us, I pray, Lord, that you would give us new eyes to see it and to, and to not just that it would become uh, clear to us, but also that it would be real and that we would actually begin to taste and see the good news of Jesus and those, Lord, who are here and they're hearing this for the first time, Lord, I pray that you would also make it clear and real to them as well, is that they would see Jesus as beautiful and that his coming truly is good news. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. In this uh, introduction to his gospel, Mark wants us to see three things about Jesus. He wants us to see his identity. Who is he? He wants us to see his, his mission, what has he come to do, and he wants us to see his message. What does he have to say to us? All of this, all of these different things, Mark simply labels as good news. This is the good news of Jesus. And as we work through these, these three different things, his identity, his, his mission, and his message, I want to have a question that is kind of just going through your minds and this question is, is true whether or not you're 8 years old or whether you're 38 years old or 88 years old. As you think about these things, I want you to be asking this. Do I see this as good news? Do I still receive this as good news? When I think about Jesus, when I think about his identity or his mission or his message, do I truly see this as good news? All right, let's, let's look at the first thing, his identity. Who is this guy? Uh, Mark does not beat around the bush. He doesn't make us guess. He doesn't build his case slowly. He just immediately, in verse 1, lets it out. Who is Jesus? This is the good news of Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Now, that is a big pill to swallow, right? We're probably familiar with that. Yes, Jesus is the Christ. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. But if you were walking, say, downtown this week, and someone came up to you and said that they were God, that they were the Son of God, what would you do? You probably wouldn't be like, oh, that's normal. You maybe would take a step back. You would gather your children in. You would uh, maybe not make eye contact because this is a big claim. Jesus is God. Now, over Christmas break, I reread uh, The Hobbit, which is the prequel to the Lord of the Rings series. And in this uh, book, you have Bilbo Baggins, who is the hobbit, right? This small, uh, big-footed, hairy-footed creature. Uh, and he is, he's hired by a company of dwarves to be their thief, right? They need to go and steal their family treasure back from no less than a dragon named Smog, and so they need a thief. And all 12 of these dwarves, they have a hard time believing that this tiny little tame creature called a hobbit 
can come to their aid. That he is the one who is going to be the thief that the whole mission is going to turn on. And yet, they all agree, unanimously agree, to bring him along in this role, not because of his own credentials or because of the experience or his, his own testimony about himself, but on the credentials of the source that recommended him. Right, Gandalf the Grey. They love this guy. He's always right. And Gandalf the Grey says, you need to bring this guy with you. And they think, I don't know about this, but because you said so, I'm going to do it. Right? Having stated this claim at the very beginning in first verse that Jesus is the Son of God, or that he is the Son of God, Mark begins to build his case about Jesus' identity, not by looking at Jesus and his testimony, but rather looking at the testimony of three different sources that build the case for him. All right, the first source that we get that speaks to Jesus' identity is the Old Testament prophecies. We see this in verse 2 and 3. He says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, Mark gives credit to Isaiah, uh, but he's actually putting two verses together from the Old Testament. Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. You don't have to turn there, but I want to read them, and I'm going to place the emphasis on a a certain few words here. This is Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 40. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. What is written? Right? What does Mark want us to see? It's that God has promised that he himself would come, that he would show up, that he would send this messenger ahead that would prepare the way for himself. Right? The Lord had promised in the Old Testament that he would be coming. And what Mark wants us to see is that the promise has come to, the, to fulfillment. He's saying, hey, this is that, right? That the coming of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. So at our first source, the Old Testament, who is Jesus? He's the Lord, right? Got it? Let's go to the second source. Is John, the one, the messenger who would come, right? The last Old Testament prophet. Look at verses 6 and 8. Now John, he's an odd-looking guy, right? He's clothed with camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is our second source, right? First we have the Old Testament showing who Jesus is. Now we have John. Now John is an odd and eccentric dude. Right, he wears hairy garments, and he ties up with a, a big leather belt. He apparently had a diet of locusts and wild honey. And while that would have been odd, like, it's, it's not unique. Like, let's say you're walking downtown Meridian, I don't know, and you, and you see a guy dressed up like Superman, you would think, that's odd, but it's not unique, right? You know who he's dressing up as. The same thing is kind of happening in John's day. Uh, somebody had dressed like this before. It was Elijah. Right, one of the greatest Old Testament prophets. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, you will read about Elijah's dress. So you have this promised messenger that's coming, and he's dressed up in the same eccentric vibe as the greatest prophet, Elijah. And what does he have to say? Which what he has to say. The one who comes after me? is so much greater than me that I cannot even stoop down and untie his sandals. While I baptize with water, he is going to come and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Right? The one that they've been waiting for, the promised messenger, the one who is dressed like the greatest Old Testament prophet of all times, he shows up and the only thing he can say is, the one who is about to come is so much greater than me. He can even direct the Holy Spirit. Now, who can do that? Who can direct the Holy Spirit? It's God alone. 
It's our second source. All pointing, right? Old Testament, John. Finally, verses 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The third source, unless we've missed it from the Old Testament or from John, is God himself. God is identifying Jesus as his beloved son. And so when Jesus shows up, we ask, who is this guy? Who is this kid? What is his identity? He is the Lord. He is God. We see it in the Old Testament prophecies. The Lord is coming. We hear it in John's testimony. He's greater than I am. We hear it from the words of God the Father. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Mark says, he wants us to hear this as good news. This is good news that God has shown up in the person of Jesus Christ. Now a question we need to ask is, why Why would God become man? Have you ever thought about that? That seems like a huge downgrade. He has to empty himself. Why would he do this? What's his purpose? There has to be some purpose for him becoming man. And so now that we have a picture of who he is, the next logical question is, okay, what is he going to do? Right? What is his mission? Why did he come? Now, obviously, Mark's going to take 16 chapters to roll this out for us. But even in the first few paragraphs of his gospel, we get these two hints of why Jesus came, of his mission. The two hints are his baptism and his temptation. All right, the first hint is his baptism. In verse five, 4 and 5, we read that John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And everybody was coming out, right? All of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river, confessing their sins. Now, that gives us a little bit of a problem, right? Because given Jesus' identity that we just said that he is God himself, why would he need to or want to be baptized? Right? He's God. Uh, he has no sins to confess. He has no need for forgiveness. He's the other side of the equation, right? He's the one who grants forgiveness. He's the one to whom we are confessing our sins. So why did Jesus get baptized? Well, the answer is in God's verbal response. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Now, we think this is just a good, you know, a father giving a compliment to his son, but biblical scholars and theologians see all sorts of Old Testament references to this uh, statement. The most important one is Isaiah 42, which says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. And here's what you need to know about Isaiah. is that in Isaiah, there are four songs that are about the servant who will come to redeem and to save his people. And in this simple declaration from Isaiah 42, you are my beloved son and and in you I am well pleased, what God is doing is he is identifying in Jesus as his promised servant who would save his people. Okay, so why did Jesus get baptized? What's going on here? Well, in his baptism, Jesus is uniting himself to a sinful and broken people. He's taking on their burden. He's taking on their sin, their identity, their problem. And in stepping into this role, God the Father gives his blessing and says, yes, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. This is good news. Not only has God himself shown up in the story, but he has not come to condemn us, but rather to save us from sin. Now let's hit pause for a minute because I've been using that word sin a lot. Uh, And if you're familiar with the Bible, you may just kind of float over it and say, yes, I know what sins are, right? I know the Ten Commandments. Maybe if you're here and you're not a believer and you're new to this, you may be thinking, okay, I don't even know what sin is or whether or not I'm in that category. So what is sin? I want to reread a quote for you that's already been read once this morning. It's on the front of your bulletins. Uh, But you need to turn there and you need to take out a pen. I'm sorry you're going to have to mark that up because, sad to say, Alvin has said a lot of good things, but Alvin did not say this. 
I messed up on my, uh, when I sent this stuff in. It wasn't Alvin Plantinga who said this. It's Cornelius Plantinga who said this in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. I think you can see how I made that mistake, right? Here's what he has to say. And what he is doing is he's looking in the Old Testament and he's saying, okay, what are all the different categories, all the different ways that sin is described? And maybe this is being read twice, I know. Maybe this is what the Lord wants you to have this morning as a bigger definition and an understanding of what actually this thing is that we simply call sin. Here's what Cornelius has to say. Sin is the missing of a target. It's getting wrong, getting it wrong. It's a, a wandering from a path. It's straying from the fold. Sin is a hard heart and a stiff neck. It's blindness and deafness. It's both an overstepping of a line and a failure to reach it, right? Transgression and shortcoming. Sin is a beast crouching at the door. In sin, people attack or evade or neglect their divine calling. These and other images suggest deviance. Even when sin is familiar, it is never normal. Sin is disruption of created harmony and then resistance to divine restoration of that harmony. And above all, sin disrupts and resists the vital human relationship to God. And it does all of this disrupting and resisting in a number of intertwined ways. Sin is culpable shalom breaking. And I think we could add from experience that sin is both delicious and repulsive. It's something that we crave and we do because we want to do it. And it's something that we hate that we have done. And this is our condition outside of Christ, that we are sinners who sin. In the, in the Old Testament, God would often refer to his people as those who had been an unfaithful wife. Right? That we had gone astray and broken uh, the heart of the relationship to God and even the heart of God because of our sin. And here is God showing up into this story. What is he going to do? Well, what do you expect when God shows up after you think about the week that you've had? What does God do? Well, instead of destroying his people, shaming his people, condemning his people, or divorcing them and sending them away to have nothing else to do with him, Jesus unites himself to a sinful people in his baptism and with the promise that he is here to fix all that is wrong, that the Savior has come and that he has not shied away from his calling. That is good news. Let's look at our second hint at his purpose, his mission. We don't just see it in his baptism, we also see it in his temptation. Now, if, if you're listening to the story well, and you're following it, tracking what's going on, we should be at the edge of our seats, right? The promised one who has come to save us, he is heading out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Now, this is a familiar thing that happens in the Bible, right? Adam and Eve, if you know the story from Genesis, they were tempted by, by, by Satan while they were in the garden. And what happened? They failed. And sin came into the world. The Israelites were tempted in the wilderness. They failed. Aaron, the first priest, he's tempted in the wilderness. He failed. Moses was tempted. He failed. He doesn't even make it into the promised land. And so we know that God has shown up in the person of Jesus. We know his mission has come to deal with sin, and now he's heading out, and he's going to the place that every one of us have gone before, and every one of us have failed. What will Jesus do? Verse 12, the Spirit does this. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the animals, and the angels were ministering to him. In the same place, that everybody else has failed who was tempted, Jesus is different. Where they have all failed, he did not. He was tempted, but he did not sin. And this is what we would call good news. That when God shows up in the middle of the story, he does not come to condemn or shame us or hurt us or get rid of us. He comes to save us from our sin. And though we, we know the power of our sin, we know what it's like to be tempted and to fail. Jesus, when he is tempted, he does not. He has come to deal with sin. As he says later in Mark, he came to seek and to save the lost. So what's his message to us? Like, what does he have to say? We know his identity. We know his mission. What does his word say? And in verses 14 and 15, Mark records his first words of Jesus. And I'm not saying the first words Jesus ever spoke. 
But these are the first words that we get from the protagonist of our story, Jesus, who is the Son of God, the Christ, who has come to deal with sin. What is he going to say? It's a one-sentence sermon. Now, after John was arrested and Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. There's a lot packed into this one-sentence sermon, and I'm a little jealous. Sometimes I wish I could preach a one-sentence sermon, right? I could just say one thing and then sit down. That'd be great. But what we see in this message is that Jesus' identity and his mission as Savior, they culminate in this clear and very disruptive declaration. Like something new has happened, right? The time is fulfilled. I've come. I'm here. The kingdom of God is at hand that something new is happening. And so what do we do? Repent and believe. Now, repent is an interesting word. It's a very disruptive word. Probably... uh, Most of us, maybe. Some of us have negative connotations with it. Maybe the last time you saw it, it was written on a sign and had some beautiful flames behind it, and somebody was yelling at you saying, repent. But what does that mean? This is Jesus' message, repent and believe in the gospel. What does it mean to repent, and why is it part of his message? Well, first, let's make sure we put it in its context. Repentance is is part of the good news. Right? It is uh, it's life-giving. It itself is a call to receive good news. Repentance simply means to turn away from. It's this idea of, of seeing something better and leaving something behind to go and get that better thing. It's to have a change of heart or mind. It is a call to stop living or maybe to thinking in a way that, that minimizes God and maximizes self. It's a call to see maybe the folly or the injustice, or the perversion, or the error of the things that we have done, or the things that we are thinking, or the ways that we feel. And to see those things and to turn from them to Jesus. And in Mark, both the self-righteous and the self-indulgent are called to repent. Anybody who comes into contact with Jesus is called to repent. We all need to. His presence is disruptive. Right? He calls us, when he shows up, to turn away from those things and to turn to him. Now, repentance is only half of the message. The second half of the good news of God is that as we turn from our current way of life or thinking or acting, we are called to turn to, to believe in the gospel, the good news that is Jesus. Like, it's not repent and do better. It's not repent and stop it. It's repent and believe. It's a call to leave the old behind and become a follower of Jesus, the one who came to save. So the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What do we do? We repent and believe in the gospel. Now, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the first century audience or whether we're talking about us as we are the audience, as we listen to and interact with Jesus and his word. With Jesus, something new has happened and something new continues to happen. Right? Jesus did not fit any category in the first century, and he doesn't fit any category that we have today. Right? We can't just simply say, oh, I have a category for that. Let's fit him into my life here. Rather, our lives have to change. We have to fit in with him. And as you read through the Gospel of Mark, one thing is is interesting is that the crowds, those who encounter Jesus, right? Everybody's encountering him. Who is this guy? What's he come to do? The crowds are split into two different camps, two different groups. There's those who follow Jesus, right, become his disciples. These are the ones who who love him, who enjoy him, who seek him out, who uh, who welcome him and who are welcomed by him, right? Followers of Jesus. And then there's those who want to destroy Jesus, That's the word Mark uses in chapter 3. They want to destroy him. They see Jesus as a threat. Uh, They want nothing to do with him, and they want him to go. So you have the lovers and the haters. That's Mark's breakup of the two groups. And most often, those who love Jesus, who follow him, uh, they have similar characteristics. They don't have their life together. They're the prostitutes. They're the tax collectors. They're the sick. They're the marginalized. 
Those are the ones who love Jesus. And they see him and they run to him. And those who hate Jesus, they often have similar characteristics. They are often the ones who have it all together. They're the ones who, more often than not, are wealthy. Uh, They're the ones who believe that they kind of have things together on their own. We could call them the self-righteous. And so this morning, as we wrap up, I want to ask just a simple question. When it comes to Jesus, which side do you fall on? Lover or hater? What I said at the beginning, do you see this as good news? Not just what he's come to do, but Jesus himself as good news. When you hear about his identity, when you hear about his mission, when you hear his, his message to repent and to believe, do you think, that is some really good news. If you're here this morning and, and you're not a Christian, I'm so glad that you're here. Does Jesus' identity and his mission and his message, does it excite you and to stir up faith in you and a desire to follow this, follow this one who has come for you? Do you sense in your heart that Jesus himself really is good news? And even now, I would invite you to do what all of us have done who are followers of Jesus, and that is two things, repent and believe. Turn from those things that have your heart and turn to Jesus and believe in the good news that he has come to save you. Cast yourself on him. Repent and believe. And if you're here and you are a believer and you long to follow Jesus, is your heart characterized by these two things, repentance and faith? Does your heart long to turn away from your sin even when you feel the pull of it? Do you long to follow Jesus and to see Him as truly good news? If so, what do you do? You repent and believe. That's what it calls us, Jesus calls us to every day. If this is not how you see Him, I'd encourage you to, to explore that. And to ask, what is missing? What am I missing about Jesus? What am I missing about myself? That when I hear about Jesus, I do not think, that is some good news. See, when Jesus shows up, he disrupts the status quo. In the first century, he does the same thing today when he is preached. And when we read about him, as he comes to us in his word, clothed in his gospel. And how could he not? There is no one like Jesus. There is no category that he fits into. And he has come to deal with sin, and he calls us to repent and to believe in the good news that is him, Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray this morning that you would uh, be at work in our hearts, and that that work would feel like this, that, that we, we, would, we would not that we would not have to feel like we need to muster up some sort of uh, desire in our heart. But rather, Lord, that we would see you and simply think, that is some good news. That is something that I needed to hear, that you have come, that you have embraced your calling as a Savior. But we know what all that entails with your cross and your love for us and how you poured out your blood for us on the cross. I pray, Lord, that these things and your message to repent and to come to you, that you are our Savior, Lord, that that uh, that we would hear that as truly good news. Lord, work in our hearts, for you are good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.